jealousy that dragon would slay's love under the pretense of keeping it alive. For the love of Cain, profiting from the word, next on So What. I'm Don Waite. And I'm Chris Dorman. And welcome back to So What? For the Love of Cain. What an interesting title for a podcast. What in the world are we talking about? Well, it's been a while since we've chatted with you guys about profiting from the Word. And uh, we were uh, just starting to open up our conversation about love and, and profiting from the Word. And, and so we just began to have a conversation a while back regarding 1 Corinthians 13. And what does love really look like? Or maybe what it doesn't look like, yeah. right? But as a way of reminder, we thought we'd better open up this conversation with what in the world is Paul talking about in 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 1? The ultimate wedding passage. Absolutely. That, well, exactly, right? <laughs> well, not verse 1, but... <laughs> yeah, right? But how about a plaque for my wall? Yes. Or what about a, just a great thing to post on Facebook? Love is patient. Love is kind. kind. It does not envy. It does, does not, not boast. boast. <sighs> yeah, right? What is Paul really addressing? Because before he gets into what love is not, he, he says something really powerful about love, setting up really our context of why he even wrote the book of 1 Corinthians to the Corinthian church to begin with. So 1 Corinthians 13 is not about romantic love. It's not about the love between a man and a woman. There you go. Okay, it's not. It's about brotherly love. It's about a love between brothers and sisters in the faith. Yes. How do we know that? Because Paul, in 1 Corinthians 12, he's talking to them about the divisions in the church over spiritual gifts. Okay, And it leads right into a conversation of like, okay, well, what should the, the gifts... And the, the gifts in the, church, in the body are about serving one another in love. Well, then what should this love look like? And then in 1 Corinthians 14, he talks about orderly worship and, and what, again, how this love has worked out, what it should look like in right. the body. So Paul is encouraging brotherly and sisterly love, not phileo, but agape love. Now remember, the Corinthian church was a young church, an immature yeah. church, a brash church, a sinful church, a church filled with division, with pride, with envy, with with uh, with the haves and the have-nots and selfishness, and it was just it was really really a mess. It was a complete it was a complete mess. Chris, can I even add that the church was so there was so much selfishness in the church that there was even selfishness in taking of the Lord's Supper. Yeah, I mean, just yeah. think about that. So Paul is addressing a people that really are very self-absorbed, uh, all about themselves. And he comes on to chapter 13 and he says, Look, even if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, I have nothing if I don't have love. If I give away all of my possessions, okay, if I give everything away and I don't have love, I've gained Nothing. If I die a martyr's death, if I'm tortured and burned for the for the cause of Christ, but I don't have love, then then I've died for nothing. It means nothing. And Calvin would say it's it's less than nothing. It's vile and disgusting to God. And so we equate love with big showy actions. So did the people in Corinth. They yes. did too. Said, look, this shows how spiritual I am. Look how I can speak in tongues. I speak in tongues more than you. Therefore, I'm more spiritual than you are. Other people will, gosh, I wish I was as spiritual as that person. And they were envying and craving and coveting that gift. And so it's just all kinds of conflict. Just tons and tons of conflict. So Paul says, look, you guys have no clue, really, really, what love is. So let me tell you what love is. Let me tell you what love is, what love should look like. In your fellowship. Yeah. And, and what's interesting about what he does as he starts to then describe agape love is he tells us what it's not. Mm. And if we're honest with ourselves, as you go through the list of all these things that it's not that we're talking about and will talk about, we're going to find ourselves in there. Yeah. To a lesser or greater degree, depending on each one of these things that Paul mm -hmm. brings to the forefront. And this week, we want to talk about jealousy right. or envy. Right. 
How many of us understand really how dangerous the sin of envy is? Have you, do you suffer, do you struggle with envy? Hmm. When you see people who have more than you, yep. does that bother you? Do you get angry? Maybe you get judgmental. Well, they have all that, but they're carnal. If they were more spiritual, they'd probably have less like I do. Do you secretly wish ill for them? Do you? I want that taken away from them. I want to see them suffer. It's not that I want it, necessarily, but you can't have it. And if I can't have it, you can't have it kind of attitude. Right. Or if I only had what they had, I would be content and I would be happy. Yeah. Hmm. Think of think of jealousy, envy in the scripture. Think about uh, think about examples of the harm that is caused from jealousy. You could argue that the first sin wasn't necessarily pride, but it was envy. Hmm. It was envy. Satan Satan tells Eve that look. God doesn't want you to be like him. God doesn't want you to know all this stuff. God doesn't want you to, he doesn't want you to have those things. Well, I want those things. I want to be like God. It's not, I'm not okay being what God has made me. I'm not okay having what God has given me. I, I want more. I'm discontented. I covet. I desire. I'm envious of what God has. I want that for myself. Right. And we know what happened after that. The very next sin that's described in the scripture after that. Within a generation, right? So now you have the Adam and Eve fall, they have kids, and now you have Cain, and you have Abel. Yeah. So you have a family union, and it's all love, 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 right? Right, just like your family, just like my family. It's all <laughs> harmonious, and everyone gets along so well. <sighs> and you, you're probably familiar with the story that Abel brings a, an acceptable sacrifice unto the Lord, and his brother... Cain does not. And Cain now has a problem with Abel. And so what does he do? He just goes up to Abel and says, man, I just want to talk to you about this, and we we need to work this thing out, right? That's what he did. Not so much. The first murder happens within the the next generation. A brother against a brother who had envy and coveted the kind of affirmation that he got, his brother got from his sacrifice. Right. Crazy. Look at Joseph. Look at all of the sin that resulted from the envy of Joseph's brothers. Mm. Right? First, first they're going to kill him. They hate him. They hate him. And it starts with that. It starts with hate. Yes. Right? It starts with hate. And that hate builds and builds and builds until finally, you know what? Let's just throw him in the cistern and let him rot and let him die. Oh, hold it. Hold it. No, no. Let's don't kill him. Let's make a buck. <laughs> let's make some money. Not... Let's make some money from it. It'll destroy our father. He'll be heartbroken. He'll never ever recover. But this this stank will be out of our lives. And we'll help him out because we'll take the robe and we'll put some blood on it. So we'll make it. Eh, well, he'll understand. Yeah, he'll still be heartbroken. His life will yeah. still. He'll, st- <laughs> he'll, st- he'll still right. be miserable. He'll still be miserable. But we'll. But again, we'll be happier. They were envious. Yeah. They were envious of their father's love for their brother, and we can understand that. It would be hurtful. To, yeah. It would be hurtful to us. If a parent responded to us that way, it would be hurtful to us. But look what their hatred resulted in, that envy resulted in. It resulted in murder. Okay? Think about Daniel. Think about Daniel. A good, godly man who is serving in the government, who's who's in a prominent role of of authority. And, And all of his underlings, they're pretty envious of him. They're pretty jealous of him. They talk the king into passing a stupid law. And Daniel says, I'm not going to honor that law. I can't. I can't. And I'm they bold. knew that. Yeah, they knew that. They knew that he was a man of integrity and that he loved God and that he would pray to his God. Mm-hmm. And, and Daniel made sure that everyone knew that he was praying to his God, right. that he was not kowtowing and submitting to a law that was unjust and that was sin for him yep. to comply with. They were envious of his position, so they got him in trouble. He's thrown into the lion's den, all stemming from envy. Envy. Wow. King David, a man after God's own heart, the king of Israel who could have whatever woman he wanted. But there was a woman that was taboo that he wanted. And what did he do to get her? That's right. 
He didn't just have his way with her once, but he made sure that he sent her husband, Uriah the Hittite, to the front lines to be killed. He killed him. He had him taken out so that he could have what he wanted. Now think of the Ten Commandments, okay? Right? You know the Ten Commandments, right? And and they go, so love your parents. Got to love your parents, right? right? Right. Okay. Don't kill anybody. Don't kill anybody. Right. Don't commit adultery. Don't mm. commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. And then don't covet. Don't covet. Don't covet. Don't don't have envy for what other people have. Because the truth is, if you if you have envy for what other people have, you know what? You're really not loving God. Right. Okay? And if our to-do list is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself, if you have envy, you're not loving God because you're not content with what God has given you, and you're not loving your neighbor as yourself because you're secretly conspiring against them, at least emotionally, mentally, in some way. Envy kills. Yes. Envy kills. Envy is so dangerous that Paul says if you live in a perpetual state of envy, envy of jealousy you will not inherit the kingdom of god it's an indication that you're really not born again that's a serious charge i don't make it lightly i don't think paul did either to the galatian church it's serious business and that's how he can then say that love agape real love towards your brother based on the agape love that god has for me i love I love because he first loved me. If I have envy, then it's not love. Right. It does not, and love doesn't envy. Yeah. Because love isn't about me. At the end of the day, love is about my love to God and mm-hmm. about the other person, the greatest commandments. That's right. right. Agape love is not looking at how lovely the other person is and saying, <laughs> I'm going to love you because of how lovely you are. It's in spite of your brokenness, I'm going to love you anyway. Just as God loves us. There's nothing lovable about us. There's right. nothing lovable in us. What do we have that we did not receive? Anything about us that is lovely is a gift mm. from him. And so we recognize in agape love, we recognize our own unworthiness, our own unloveliness, and the grace and compassion and mercy that has been poured out on us super abundantly in Jesus. And mm. we seek to share that with others. And there we don't envy other people's success. We don't begrudge them their own happiness. Maybe they have health that you don't have. Mm. Maybe their families are intact. Maybe they've never suffered a loss like you have had or the ongoing issues that you have to struggle with. We don't begrudge them for that. We praise God for that. We're thankful for that. We wish them well. We want them to be well and to do well because we love them period. The the eyes and the ears, they function together, right? In 1 Corinthians 12, he's talking about the the harmony of the unity of the body and how it works together. The foot doesn't envy the hand. The heart doesn't envy the the belly button. Okay? It all works in concert. It all works in unity together. And, And Paul is saying, that's a picture of how we're to function. But if we're envying one another, then we can. We're going to plot against one another. We're going to secretly wish harm on the other. Or maybe, like David, we'll take overt steps to harm the other who we envy. And don't make no mistake about it, David envied Uriah. Yes. Okay? He coveted against Uriah. He desired what Uriah had. So before he murdered Uriah, he coveted against Uriah. Before he committed adultery with Bathsheba, he coveted Bathsheba. He was not content with what God had given him yes. thus far. That's right. There was still at least one more thing, God, that I need to be happy. Yeah. I know somebody needs to hear this right now. You and your brokenness, you with your problems, you with your pain, you with your issues, you with your lostness and not knowing what to do with your life, all those things, you are valuable. You have infinite value because of the work of the cross, because God has put his stamp on you and he has made you his own. Hmm. You are, can I tell you, you are something so special. And who am I to not love you the way I'm called to love you? We, we are called to love one another, Chris, in our brokenness. 
you talked about 1 Corinthians 12. Some gifts seem to be more elevated than others in many churches. Your giftedness is no less important than the gift of the man who's in the pulpit. Did you know that? Your gift of mercy or your gift of discernment that maybe goes unnoticed by so many people you know is significant in the eyes of God because he has given you that giftedness by his Holy Spirit. And he wants you to use that for the benefit and to express love to others. You're important. Mm -hmm. You are. So we've said before that we have a to-do list every day. To yep. love our God with everything we are and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Yep. Francis Schaeffer in his book, True Spirituality, said the test of that is, do we love God enough to be content? Mm. Do we love our neighbor enough not to envy? Those are the tests, he says, of whether or not we're obeying those two commandments. Search your heart. Do you have envy? Do you? Understand where it's birthed. Mm -hmm. It starts first really with a discontent in who you are and who God has made you. The station he has placed you in, the disabilities he may have blessed you with. You were made yeah. on purpose for his purposes and his glory. Mm -hmm. And your circumstances ultimately are in his hands. Can you rejoice in your circumstances? Can you be content whatever your circumstances are? If the answer is no, you will have envy because you will want what God hasn't given you. Hmm. And that want is a cancer that kills. It's a cancer that leads to murder and hate and all kinds of other terrible, terrible things. And it, it's not love. And that's why we're here. We're here for his glory, to reflect his glory, his love for us. The world will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. Are you loving? Do you love, do you love your brothers and sisters enough not to envy? If not, then you got business to do with God. Right. It's serious. It could very well be that you have the love of Cain. Indeed. Thank you for tuning in, my friends, and I'll talk to you next week. We'll see you soon.